Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to go on a bit of adventure and we're going to explore the idea of planetary nebula. We're going to leave our planet Earth and take a look at some of these really really cool structures that are pretty much everywhere in our galaxy and we're going to discover what they are, how they look and how they're actually made. Anyway, welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So this is actually one of the planetary nebula we're uh, going to explore today and this one is called Medusa Nebula. Now let's start by actually talking about the name itself. Why is it called planetary nebula? And the explanation is actually really 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 simple. It's a mistake. And it's a mistake that was made by the first astronomers in 18th century when they started observing these objects and um, the astronomer by the name of uh, William Herschel kind of thought that from a distance, and I'm going to try to show it to you here, from a distance they sort of looked like gas from a gas giant. So they kind of resembled uh, planets like Uranus and Neptune, at least in his case. Um, and for him, these looked like planetary nebula, and so he called them that. And this term really stuck. It stuck for hundreds of years, and people started using uh, the term planetary nebula for pretty much until now. And even though we know that it's not a proper name for these objects, uh, it might actually stay with, uh, with us for quite a while. As a matter of fact, it might never change because we don't really want to change uh, the term anymore. Anyway, let's go back to Earth and I'm going to show you some of the um, closest nebula to us which actually uh, are not that easily visible from Earth. Planetary nebulae are a lot smaller than um, supernova nebula, and they're actually not as dramatic either, but they are, they are very, very, very different. So overall, planetary nebula are kind of similar to the nebulae formed from supernova, but they're a lot smaller and they're not as dramatic. And um, from our planet Earth, if you have a telescope, you can see quite a lot. We've discovered about 3,000 of them in our galaxy, and the first one discovered was actually this object right here, known as the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, we're going to try to find it right here. And so this is kind of what it would look like if you were to look at it from planet Earth. But obviously here we have to zoom in a little bit just to try to see it at all. Uh, this was actually discovered by um, one of the earlier astronomers. Uh, the same person that actually named a lot of other objects. Uh, this was Charles Messier, and uh, this object has a name M27 because it was actually uh, discovered and classified by Messier, and M here st stands for his name. So it does look like a dumbbell, and so it is called a dumbbell nebula. We're going to go jump into it and fly through it as well, just to kind of give you an idea of what uh, these objects actually uh, look like on the inside, because they don't really look much different from supernova or from a lot of other nebulous objects. And uh, so if you actually go inside here, you'll find yourself inside highly ionized gas. Now, when the scientists um, early on were looking at this gas, they, they actually realized that it was emitting a very unusual pattern of emission lines around 500 nanometer in length. And this didn't really correspond to any uh, known material on Earth. And for this reason, they actually assumed that this was some sort of a new material. They called it um, nebulium after nebula. And they, they thought uh, this material only existed in these nebulae. And they had a lot of papers written about it, but then it turned out that there was no such thing. And as a matter of fact, um, within a few years, uh, another scientist uh, was able to actually recreate this kind of a um, similar pattern in the lab. And they realized that um, these emission lines were formed by um, a simple ionization of oxygen, nitrogen, and a few other materials, but really mostly oxygen. And so if you ionize oxygen, if you basically give it a lot of energy, its electrons start emitting this very unusual pattern of emission lines. And uh, so this, in a sense, is a very highly energetic, but very rare and very unusual gas. And this gas will one day expand and kind of fly away from here and will then be responsible for forming new stars and new planets. And uh, so this is actually how a lot of oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon is recycled in our own um, galaxy and also just in the universe in general. So a lot of this material will then turn into new stars. 
And what's really interesting about these objects is that a lot of them actually look very, very different from each other. As a matter of fact, here's another one known as the Saturn's Ring Nebula, for obvious reasons. If you actually look closer, it kind of does resemble Saturn in some sense. And um, for uh, most of these objects, the shape is determined by several factors, including um, the gravitational interaction with objects nearby, the fact that maybe some of them might have binary systems inside, the magnetic field of the original star, and um, just in general where they're located and what's around them. Uh, so, for the most part, all of these look very different. Here's actually a picture, a uh, composite picture of many of these nebulae together. And you can see that uh, the biggest one is about four light years across, and this is the one that's already near the end of its life. Uh, and the smallest ones are very, very tiny. Although, when I say tiny, I mean they're basically several times the size of our own solar system. Uh, but uh, if you actually go inside of here, you will experience quite a lot of ultraviolet radiation. And so, this is actually what provides the light and uh, the energy to these objects. The ultraviolet radiation from the object in the middle, in the center of the planetary nebula. And this object is essentially the owner of this gas. It's a star. It's a star very, very similar to our own sun. And we know for a fact that our sun will actually become an object that's going to be very similar to this. It's going to undergo um, an expansion, become a red giant, and basically expel this huge shell of beautiful gas that will probably look something like this, or maybe it'll look something completely different, but it will definitely be quite a sight to see. Uh, so pretty much any star between um, around half a mass of the sun to about eight masses of the sun will actually create these beautiful objects. Anything lower than that becomes a white dwarf without undergoing this, and anything more than that um, actually goes through supernova. So, for the most part, this is actually uh, what almost all, if not all, of the Sun-like stars or G-type stars will go through. And here's actually one that looks more or less spherical, uh, mostly because there was almost no interaction with anything here and the gas just kind of expanded. Um, now, the reason the gas is actually so different in colors is um, because of several factors as well. One of them is the composition, but the other one is the actual temperature of the central star. So if the star here is a lot hotter, it produces more ultraviolet light, and it actually um, creates a variety of colors. On the other hand, if the star is a little bit cooler, it might not produce as much variation. And the other thing is that uh, these objects don't actually last very long. As a matter of fact, so here's Ant Nebula. Um, this will only last for about less than 10,000 years. I mean, in stellar terms, it's nothing. It's, it's basically something that will disappear uh, before you even notice any other planets or stars disappear. Because they only last for about 10,000 years, it means that um, our ancestors, when, you know, when we started keeping history, may have actually seen the birth of one of these objects, and we might be seeing the end of one of these objects. Or they might have even seen more of these nearby uh, that we don't see anymore. So, for example, objects like Sirius may have actually had this um, a few million years ago, and our early ancestors may have actually seen some kind of a um, planetary nebula very, very close to our own um, solar system. This might have been something absolutely incredible to see. And this right here, Helix Nebula, this is actually um, the closest one to us. It doesn't really look like this at all from Earth. It, as a matter of fact, it looks like this. And you may have seen this uh, photo somewhere uh, before because it, it is one of the most uh, famous nebula out there. Uh, so this is essentially the future of our own sun. And I kind of would love to actually see in, you know, 5 billion years from now what our sun would actually create as well, because a lot of these patterns are so different, so unique, and so beautiful. Uh, so let's actually go back to Earth and take a look at Helix Nebula from Earth, just so we can actually get an idea of how far away this actually is, because this is still uh, several thousand light years away from us. So somewhere over there in the skies of Earth, you can kind of, if you zoom in, that is, see the Helix Nebula. There it is. Well, anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about in this video, and hopefully you learned something from it, and hopefully now you know a little bit about planetary nebula and why this is actually not a proper term to use for these objects, because they're not really planetary, but they are nebula. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.
Oh, and by the way, a long time ago, these scientists also thought that Andromeda was a nebula. As a matter of fact, they even thought it was a planetary nebula. But then they realized it was actually something completely different. It was a galaxy.